Welcome to the Modifier Monday Ambulance Origin and Destination Modifiers. This is part of our modifier series that we do the first Monday of each month. I'm Tom Ryan, with Provider Out Outreach and Education, and I'll be your presenter today. I am joined by Leanne Foster from my team. She's going to help me with technical problems and also with those chat questions. So I do want to encourage you again, anything you have, put it into chat. We'll get those answered later on. One of the things I want to make very clear is this webinar is in response to questions that you asked. So the slides that are built and the information on those slides is based in the questions that were asked originally. So where do we take the questions from? Previous ambulance webinars. We've done quite a few throughout um, the end of uh, last quarter of last year and then the beginning quarters of this year. So we took as many of those questions as we could and we really focused on the origin and destination modifier for this webinar. We will continue to do those in the future couple of things you want to be aware of. We actually have two more scheduled ambulance webinars right now that are specifically focused at ambulance. One is coming up in just a week or so. It's going to be on the 10th and it's ground ambulance provider enrollment. So this one's based on the questions that we've been getting from ground ambulance providers about the enrollment, the enrollment process and how we do all of that. So we want to make sure you're aware of that. Second one is going to come up in May and this is May 9th. And this is ambulance transports during inpatient hospital stays. Now, again, both of these will allow you to ask questions in advance and put them into your registration process. If you use those, that's going to be the best opportunity for us to help you. I can be prepared. Leanne can be prepared. We can get you through the information. If you don't use that, I may have to take it back and do a little bit of research. I will let you know that I did ask Leanne to put both on the live events page, which is where you would register, and also the ambulance playlist for all the previous stuff we've done. Um, into the chat feature. One uh, quick announcement and then I'll move on to my disclaimer. We WPS government health administrators is updating our website secure section. You'll commonly hear this referred to as the portal. We're doing some enhanced programming on the servers and the look and feel to make it a bit easier to use. Did some data analysis to try to determine how you get to different things. So we're doing definitely some enhancements on that but a lot of what you're going to see um, one less opportunities to move around, but still not taking any functionality away, hopefully making it easier to find what you're looking for. But the biggest one is all underneath ability and making sure everything functions in that manner and that we don't have as many issues as we previously have had. We aren't sure of the exact release date, so keep checking that out. We are hoping to have that done by the end of summer 2024. So we'll get more as we go and we'll definitely keep you guys informed. Disclaimer, of course, I've got to give you a little bit of uh, information about this webinar and some things I want you to know. And this webinar is um, a, to assist you. The rules and regulations of Medicare are still going to override this webinar at any given place. I will show you an area within the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website. We have some people that are new to Medicare and they ask specifically for a resource or where they would go to find this information. So we're going to include that and we'll actually navigate to it. And I want to make sure you have that information available to you. That changes, you do have to know those changes, and that's on again the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website. Based the questions and the information within this presentation on the questions that I got. So if you're saying I don't know this or I don't know that or something, put it into chat. Let me help you out. Um, I'd really love to give you guys as much information as possible. If you disagree with the statement that I make, put it into chat. Let me disagree. I can explain or justify everything. Um, or actually provide you with a resource for it in a lot of cases. If I don't know that and you disagree with it, then I'll definitely take it back and look that up for you. Last, CMS does prohibit the recording of this presentation for profit making purposes. We just aren't sure how you're going to use it, so we just ask that you don't record, screenshot, or do anything like that. What we will do is record it for you. You heard me mention that I started a recording earlier, and we'll put that onto our um, YouTube channel in our Encore playlist and then in our Ambulance playlist. So you'll definitely have the opportunity to watch it again should you want to. All right, let's move on. So what are we doing today? Our objective is to look at the Medicare claims errors when using the ambulance origin and destination modifiers. And then as we look at those claims errors, we want to avoid but we also want to answer the questions that you gave us. How can we help you get through what you need to make sure we have that done? In order to do that, I will explain or define what the modifiers are. I'm going to explain the importance of it. I'm going to give you some tips based on the questions that you've asked for proper use. That's why giving me questions throughout that I can answer as we come to these different inf pieces of information are going to be really important. So the very first section is actually going to be those definitions. And the reason that I built this in is um, 
someone asked a couple of things. One, were there any changes for 2024? And not that we're aware of. Um, we don't have anything that we really saw that change. But at the same time, we then had several things saying, I'm new to Medicare. I'm not even really sure where to start with this or what information I need from this. So can you help me with that? That's what this section is really designed for. We want to make sure that those that are new to Medicare have what they need before we get too in depth into any of the information. So for some of you, this is going to be an overview and we apologize. We're going to try to keep that part as short as we can, but still give enough history and background to those that really need it. Let's get started. So what is an origin and a destination modifier? First of all, it is two characters coding representing the location that you pick them up at and the location that you drop them off at. Pop and pod. Point of pickup, pop. Point of drop off, pod. The two characters are in exactly that order. I pick them up, that's my first character. I drop them off, that is my second character. And characters are alpha characters. There's no numbers, they're all gonna be something within the alphabet. They are required by CMS for all ambulance claims that are billed directly to CMS. Now we say that because there are certain claims and certain times when you may bill someone else. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into it. Sometimes that's referred to as bundling. So they're in a hospital or they're in a skilled nursing facility. Those are bundled or billed to the facility versus Medicare. So Medicare can only require you to bill us with these when we need it, Medicare needs it. So when we look at this, again, it's required on all claims. There is one exception, we're not quite to that exception yet, but we will talk about that in a little while. So your basic gist is this is considered a modifier. The modifier consists of two alpha characters. I'm gonna show you those in a little bit, which is actually the next slide. And they are put in place for origin first and destination last. And again, it's just a coded representation of the information within the medical record. That I have to know, is it a hospital? Is it a residence? What is it? Where did you pick them up and where did you drop them off? Because that plays into the next slide, which is our current list. And our current list is available in Chapter 15, which is the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 15. And you can see I've actually given you a little bit of a list here. But this is one of the things that asked me where this information specifically located. So I did give you a direct link. If you go ahead and select right here, it will open it directly. I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. And you can see, oh, there it goes. Sorry, you can see it took me a little bit. So this is directly to the chapter. Don't want to stop there though. What I do want to do is teach you where this is at because this is such a key thing talking about processing ambulance claims. There's lots more information than just the origin and destination modifier, but let's go ahead and just jump over to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website. We're going to focus on where to locate this claims processing manual. Again, you could use the link to make it quick, but let's do it the long way. So first, cms.gov right up in your address bar. Once you've done that, you're going to come to the word Medicare. That's what we're talking about. Open that drop down, regulations and guidelines, and manuals. Once manuals opens, then you're going to go to the internet only manuals in the left side. Okay, internet only manuals. Then you're going to get a whole list of internet only manuals. Remember I said it's the claims processing manual. So that's got a publication number of 100-04. We'll select our publication number. And then if we scroll down, we've got a lot of different chapters in there. Now keep in mind, some of these like general billing requirements, you're still expected to know. It's still the general basics of billing Medicare. But in particular, we are talking about chapter 15. That's right here. This is the Ambulance Claims Processing Manual. It walks us through all of the different items we have to know. So then we'll look at like just unbilling guidelines and instructions and basic information you need to know. So where do you have to go from here? And remember way back on that slide, I said it's 30A, which means you're gonna go to 30, General Billing Guidelines. What's great about this manual is that you can just select 30. You don't have to scroll through. You could also use the page system over here and find it. You could use control F if you wanted to, to open your find feature. Once we get there, general billing guidelines here. A. So not 30.1 or anything like that. It's just 30 A. And then it says that according to this, doesn't matter what you're billing on, which is what this part says up here, here are the modifiers you have to pick from. And these will represent your origin and your destination. 
then they're also going to tell you certain things like this one is a destination code only. That would be the exits and the intermediate stop. We're going to talk about that in just a little while because um, I want to make sure that we have everything in place. So just keep, keep in mind, this is a code pair combination. It's put two of these alpha characters here together to represent, to make a full modifier, which then represents where you picked the patient up at or the pop and where you drop them off at or the pod. Again, point of pickup, point of drop off, pop and pod. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my PowerPoint and I'm gonna go ahead and bring up our first opportunity to ask questions. So a couple of things, I'm gonna go ahead and read off one question that I would like to answer based on previously, or I'm sorry, pre-submitted information added into registration, then we'll go ahead and open it up. Uh, during that time, Leanne's gonna gather any questions that we may have come in through the chat. So, all right, question, death with transport, do I need an origin and destination modifier? How do I build that? So the expectation for the origin and destination modifier is that when the patient dies before transport, but after ditch dispatch. So you don't know at dispatch that they're dead, right? They could be dead, but you could be dispatched to a possible heart attack. So you get there expecting a possible heart attack and they've been dead for three days, okay? Somewhere within at the dispatch, potential live patient. Different than when they say, hey, we're dispatching you to a dead patient, go check it out. Well, that's a dead patient, and unfortunately, that's not payable by Medicare. There's no medical necessity for that. If it happens, though, do you need an origin and destination modifier when you arrive, and they're dead, you still do not need to transport them? And the answer is no. You would use the QL, quit living, some people like to call it, QL modifier. Now, other people do say, hey, I have to have it. My system won't let me do anything without the origin and destination modifier, that's fine as well. You can put the QL in the first position and the origin and destination modifier in the second position, and we're good. Our systems will accept that in most cases. Now, there's a variety of other edits that can cause other things to happen in the systems, and we'll talk about some of those as we get a little bit more. So I want to make it very clear that origin destination modifier for an ambulance does not need to be there upon um, when you arrive on scene to an expected living patient, but you find out they're dead before transport. Now, if they die during transport, that's just a normal transport. And yes, an origin and destination modifier is needed. All right, so that was the one pre-submitted question I wanted to cover during this area. Uh, Leanne, did we have any questions? We do not have any questions at this time. Okay, I'll go ahead and move on. Again, if you guys have questions, please put them in chat for me. So the importance, and you can see this grainy picture says, hey, I'm documenting something. That's the key thing here. We do have to have the documentation to support the origin and the destination. Now keep in mind, origin, des origin is a little different than destination. Sometimes we don't have an exact address for origin, but we still have to have that. That then has to be coded into of those codes that I showed you, and I'll get to those in just a few moments. But this is where some of the questions come in. Now, destination is very different. You cannot like attempt or force um, a destination, either it is or it is not covered by Medicare. Origin's a little different in that you have to try to pick the best one that best works, if that makes sense, and we'll talk more about that. But it's very important and documentation definitely needs to be there. So let's move on for just a second here. So is it payable or not? This is what this origin destination can make things payable and some things not. So let me give you an example. If a destination is a P, which would stand for physician's office, this is a non-payable Part B ambulance claim. Why? Because Medicare doesn't cover that. If a destination is a freestanding emergency room, freestanding being key here, it's not associated to a hospital, it's not part of a hospital, and we're gonna talk more about that, then it becomes non-payable. So it can actually make a full transport not payable. Using the wrong code can affect things. Can make a transport bundle into another service. I'm gonna focus on this one more too, but if it's a skilled nursing facility and it's to a certain type of service, so let's say we're going for a MRI and it's not done in the correct location, then by putting the correct code on there it can make it part of the skilled nursing facility claim or it can tell us it should be excluded. And I will explain that in just a few moments. Okay, so don't, don't get up on that one quite yet. 
and it can cause a processable or a return to provider. In other words, can make this claim not do anything, can say, hey, we don't know what you're doing. So if you use something that is not on that coded list that CMS gave you in the internet only menu that I showed you, which again, we'll come to in just a few moments, we don't know what that is. So it's gonna cause something wrong with the system. We can't do anything with this because we don't know what you mean by that. So that's why we wanna make sure we're using the correct code. Now, if you do have that happen, if it's a, um, a UB04 or a 837i and it's going into FIS, the physical intermediary standard or shared system, FIS, that claim you have to go in and fix or send in a new claim. If it is a 1500 claim or an 837p claim, either one, and it goes into MCS, the multi-carrier system, then you just send in a new claim to fix that. There's nothing we can do with that one. So all of these lead to other problems, and that's where some of the questions came from, at least in my opinion. That's some of the stuff you wanted me to cover today, and that's why the slides were built in the manner that they were. So let's move on and talk about hospitals first. So what is a hospital? Well, first, remember, it's by Medicare definition of a hospital. This does not just mean an acute care hospital. You may be familiar with that. You're in a large city. There's a hospital down the road. That's your acute care hospital. It could be a children's hospital. And yes, Medicare does cover that as a destination. Remember, Medicare patients can be children if they have a disability form with it or become disabled before their 18th birthday. They could be eligible for Medicare. So a children's hospital does work as a hospital. Under the Medicare rules, it's just another form of a hospital when they enroll. Critical access hospital. Now this one is the same as any other hospital in terms of an ambulance transport, in terms of an H. Now H is the character that you will use in first or second position to represent a hospital. The reason that it is separate or separately looked at in terms of Medicare is the type of payment methodology that a um, critical access hospital has, still a hospital. Long-term care hospital and inpatient psychiatric facilities, these are all forms of a hospital. Now, what I want you to do is note that I um, put some other ones a little bit differently here. Inpatient rehabilitation facility, this is another form of a hospital. It is not a skilled nursing facility. I wanna make that clear. This is something where they need full-time care, but it's really designed or specialized for inpatient rehabilitation. So it's not a nursing home. It's not a skilled nursing facility. We'll talk more about that. And then specialty hospitals. So this could be a cancer hospital. This could be something like that. These are still hospitals for ambulance billing purposes. And freestanding emergency rooms fully owned by a hospital are still going to be a hospital. This in particular was a question that we have come in and that's why it's built in that manner. So if an emergency room, which is freestanding, is not owned and operated by a hospital, it is not a covered destination by Medicare. The reason for that at this time is that there is no licensing credentialing going on that meets the Medicare requirements for them to enroll with Medicare. So when they go to enroll with Medicare as a hospital facility, they are considered off campus. Don't get hung up on that. I'll come more to that in a little while, but it's still going to be considered a hospital. Okay. You want to then keep going. So what comes next? The next series of questions that I got was related to diagnostic facilities. So D, when do I use this? When is it appropriate? And can I give specific examples of what would be considered a diagnostic or therapeutic site? Again, this is D. First of all, it is a freestanding or independent facility. So think about that if you're getting an MRI. Could this, could you have a freestanding MRI center? Could you have a freestanding lab? Could you have some other form of freestanding x-rays, radiology centers? Those are all diagnostic or therapeutic facilities, okay? Could you have a freestanding therapy site, PT, OT, SLP, um, any of those? So physical therapy, occupational therapy, or um, speech language pathology site. So it's not related to a hospital or a physician's office. Those are the two categories. So yes, this particular therapy is all done separately. It's done in an outpatient place, but it's not owned by a hospital. It's independent therapists working on their own. Yes, we would pay for transport. That's a D. That's a diagnostic or therapeutic site. That's the goal. We want to make sure, though, to keep it different. 
from a hospital, which would have been the H that we talked about, or a physician's office, which we haven't quite got to yet. Um, if you have more questions or you need better example of this, please feel free to put that into chat. I'm going to go ahead and go on and we'll come back to that should we need it in just a few moments. So correct use of nursing facility. Now nursing facility is a little different because we have two different representations of a nursing facility. And this is where a lot of people get confused. So first of all, in E is a domiciliary custodial care or residential. Things to keep in mind, the stay is not medically necessary. I live at a nursing home. I'm not in a medical stay of any kind. That's an E. Um, the Medicare days are exhausted. Medicare is no longer paying that nursing home for that stay. So they're still covering some services like some outpatient services that would normally be covered, but the room, the board, that type of coverage, that is an E. Yes, this means one day it could be something else and then becomes an E and that something else is an N and we're going to talk about that. Also, Medicare is not paying it because they did not have the three-day qualifying hospital stay before entering into the medically necessary skilled, stare, skilled care. This is an exclusion Medicare policy from the Medicare rules under the law. Therefore, it's an E. So when you're really looking at this, you do need to communicate quite effectively with your nursing facilities. What are we talking about here? Because the difference is N, skilled nursing facility. This is a medically necessary stay in which Medicare Part A is covering the stay. Why is this so important? Anyone? Let me just answer that for you. If you have not heard a skilled nursing facility consolidated billing, this modifier directly affects that. In E means not part of consolidated billing, and N means yes, consolidated billing is a potential effect. Okay, so if you're billing with an E and they're coming off of their own regular stay, someone said, hey, it's a 55 and older community. That's not either one of these, right? 55 and older community could just be an apartment. So we'll talk more about that one too in a little bit. So we want to make sure we're getting the right type of E versus N. Again, if they live in a skilled, or they, I'm sorry, they live in a nursing facility, but they do not receive skilled care, it's automatically an E saying, hey, this nursing facility will not be responsible because today they're not in that type of a bed. They're not in that type of a stay. So it's very key there. And then the N is for they are in that type of a stay and consolidating billing rules would apply. So we want to make sure we're doing the difference there and we're getting back and forth with that. Now keep in mind, if you're looking at the N, looking at the N, then we have to look further into it. So we're going to leave the E, we're going to focus on the N. Okay, under the skilled nursing facility consolidated billing rules, this means first of all, there's 100 covered days within a Medicare benefit period. Okay, so you have to ask, hey, are they at a leave of absence today? Were they there at midnight? If not, then it's a leave of absence. Yep. Also, there's very specific criteria for this. If you bill an end to an end, two skilled nursing facilities, then you have to bill to the SNF at the point of pickup. What does that mean? The one they're leaving gets the bill. That's all coming from this revision document. I'm going to show this to you in just a few moments. I'm going to tell you the easiest way to find this is to actually have the title available or just to use the link. P. Now, this is a physician's office. This works differently because they're coming from a skilled nursing facility. So if the origin or destination modifier is a P, then you have to build the skilled nursing facility. The skilled nursing facility is still responsible for that transport. Um, again, it's something different than the regular P destination because they are inpatient in a skilled nursing facility. N as a destination for initial transports. Does this make sense? I'm coming from a hospital and I'm going to the skilled nursing facility. I'm going to begin medically necessary stay. That means it's going to be billed as an N. You could bill it as an E if they don't have that qualifying three-day stay or a variety of other factors play into it. But if N is the destination, you're still going to bill Medicare. Sometimes this is going to deny and you're going to have to tell us why. The reason why is they were not in that skilled nursing facility at that time. They could not have been until the admission occurred. Here's the problem. The system doesn't say your transport occurred at 9.30 a.m. and the admission occurred at 10.30 a.m. 
Nothing within our system tracks that time. So when the system coming in, just automatically denies it. Again, did you catch that word? Automatically. So if it's automatically denied, well, what do you have to do? Well, then you have to file an appeal to tell us it's different. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at this quick revision article here. And I'm going to just pull up the article. Again, you could search it on the CMS website. Um, I just have it automatically saved to make it a little bit easier here. This is an older article and it has been revised a few different times. So you'll notice that it does have an effective date. It is still in effect today. It did relate to a change request. Um, I'm sorry, it related to a one-time notification, which is what this number is. But as we scroll through, it's gonna give you a lot of information that you need to know. It's key to understand this. If you are not familiar with this, please download the handout, the presentation, and take a look at this. You can also search the CMS website. All the information I just went through, a lot of it's right here. So here's a critical access between two SNFs, um, emergency transport. You guys asked me about emergency transport for certain things, where and how they fall into play. Okay. Here's your formal discharge information, round trip physician's office. This then explains why a physician's office is billed to the SNF per the Code of Federal Regulations. So it's going to give you the resources that you can actually take a look at to get the legal. So when the SNF says, no, I don't need to pay that, or yes, I should pay that, it's right here. This is where it's coming from, and this is a legal binding thing in the United States, Code of Federal Regulations. So it's great to have these opportunities for you. I'm just going to keep scrolling down a little bit. Um, this talks about the non-emergency forms of transport and how we don't cover those, just so you're aware. A little bit more information you might want and then some document history and this moves on to the next page. So again, if you're looking for this and you don't do anything else, but you keep this title, so you're going to keep that slide. If this link becomes broken, you can do a couple of different things. One, I'm just going to copy it. If I go to the CMS website, right, just like we were before, we want to go right back to CMS. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is just back out of this, just right up here in the search feature. Why? Because the way to navigate to it is really complex. You got to go through about five to 10 steps. I'd rather just have you guys search for it. I'm going to give you the title, give it to you in the slides, give it to you again. It's going to tell you, hey, this is what you're looking for, right? That's what we're looking at right here. This is the formal page, which is where the OTN or the one-time notification originally came from. You can look through all the different ones that you want to learn. Any one of these, it's going to take you to the same thing. I'm just going to use the OTN. Because again, this is the formal page. This is the portion that updated what we needed it to update. And here then you'll go through, it'll tell you, okay, this was issued first on, implementation date was on, if there's a revision, any of that type of information, this will help you through that. And that's why I wanted to bring you to this page. And then this is the MLN that we had previously open. Um, I did have issues opening it this morning, which is why I opened it the other way, because it wasn't opening for me. I'll give it a shot. Oh, of course, right away. But again, it's the same MLN, um, but because I did have some issues with it this morning, I thought I would just save it, which I didn't necessarily need to do. So hopefully that answers your questions about that. Please keep in mind on the CMS website as well, if you're talking about the skilled nursing facility, then you would need to go to Medicare. You're gonna come down and you're gonna find, uh, I'm sorry, John a blank here on the right section and you're going to look for coding and billing, skilled nursing facility consolidated billing under coding and billing okay then you're going to come to this page and all of your files are over here i will let you know that if you want to take a class on how to read these files please we already did a full on encore um we've already did a full webinar on this we talked about it in an encore setting go ahead take a look at that it's on our youtube channel we'll get get you through this information for this. So it's definitely something we have available already. So I didn't want to go through that again. All right. Um, let's see. So we should be on correct use, correct use. Now I have a very different one because in the definition, it says it's a site of transfer, but it goes on further to say between methods of transportation. This means it can't be ground to ground. It's not meeting the definition of this use. Now someone said, well, you know, you said for an origin, we have to use the best one. I do understand that you could use this. So your ground rig is coming, it breaks down, another ground rig comes, 
the best one for you to do would be the eye. Okay, I get that because that's just what it is. However, the one that left, you didn't have or you weren't scheduled to down the side of the road. So you didn't do a site, you didn't do a method to method transport and I doesn't work for that. Okay, and I does not work for that. The, the first one, the one that broke down, you don't actually have a billable transport. You did not complete a transfer. You did not complete any of that. And that's one of the key things for Medicare. So it is correct use has to be an intended destination. That's what I was just talking about, but it's ground to air. That is your method of transport. Someone did ask a question if they could use this at an airport going to a fixed wing and absolutely, absolutely. That's exactly what it's intended for. Could you also do it from ground to a helicopter pad? Uh, yes, yes, you could. Again, it just depends on where the helicopter pad is located, right? How far do they have to go to get in there? Do we need to transport them by ground to safely do that? If we do, then yes, you've got a site of transfer. All right. So again, you're just going to fit this into the best situation you can. If it, if it makes sense for an origin, great. But for a destination, you really do want to look at whether or not it is between two methods of transport. What are we doing here? So we really do have to do that. So for a destination, when a rig breaks down, it as a destination doesn't work, right? Why is it incorrect? Because it's not between methods of transport. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Next is residence. Um, this was one we had a couple of questions come in and it was more related to some misunderstandings, I believe. Uh, so one of the questions was to find private residence. So that's why I put this in there. A uh, private residence is not defined as the patient's home. It can be the patient's home. Um, it could be even like someone that lives in a 55 and older community and it's their apartment and they live within that community, but they don't receive any type of medical care or any type of anything. They're just living in an apartment there. That's still their patient's home. Okay. Could also be another person's home. We had someone that was taken to their child's home after, and that is still a residence. Medicare does cover that. Okay. Residence is a covered origin and destination. And an apartment not meeting the criteria below. That's one of the key things that we want to talk about because that's the difference between N, which we talked about earlier as well, but again, here it comes up with residence, domiciliary, custodial, or residential facility. So if it's a facility, such as a skilled nursing facility, but they are not in a medically necessary state and they live there, you want to make sure you're using an N. You're going to use that particular code versus the R, which says it's a residence. So there's a little bit of a difference there. And someone said, uh, we did have a question that came in and it was more of a scenario driven one, but they have one facility and that facility has multiple buildings on the same campus. Inside are these multiple buildings. One of them is a 50 older living apartment community. That is going to be in R. They also have assisted living. So they're receiving some form of care, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's medical care. That is going to be a N. They're still getting something going on there, right? And then finally they said, well, they also have a skilled nursing facility. And if they're in a medically necessary stay, then that's the going nuts not to be either one of these. What's that one going to be? And we talked about it earlier. So that one would be the skilled nursing facility code, the true N. Okay, just want to make sure we're following with that one. Um, Sorry, I don't know what happened there. It suddenly started flipping forward. So when we look at this, we want to make sure we're using the right thing. Okay. So make sure that we're using, I'm sorry, the N versus the E correctly. This slide, actually it appears residence domiciliary. That should be an E, um, which is not built into that. The N should be down here. So correct this slide if you would for me. R residence, E residential, and N skilled nursing facility. Um, I know it's I had it correct and I do not have it correct on the slide. I apologize for that. Let's continue going on a little bit here. And we did have a question come in about the X as a destination and an origin. So let's talk about physician's offices and how care considers those. First of all, they're very different. So you've got a P. This is your physician's office as an origin. You picked them up, something happened at that physician's office and they need to go to the ER, they need to go to a hospital, they need to go somewhere. That would be a P. Now, if it's a destination, it's not separately payable by Medicare. Key thing there is as a destination, 
What does that mean? It means Medicare does not pay for you to transport someone to a physician's office. We do to a freestanding diagnostic facility, but not a physician's office. So the goal or the intent is to go to this physician's office for an office visit, we're not gonna pay for that. That is an excluded service. So as an origin, yeah, just use the best one if this is what best fits. As a destination, no. On the other hand, Medicare does have this X, and this is where some people got a little bit confused based on the questions that I got in. X, I'm on my way to another covered destination, but the patient's condition is so emergent that I need to stop wherever I can to get them medically necessary care. This could be a stabilization, this could be whatever, and the closest place for me to stop for that medical care is a physician's office. So you didn't plan to stop there, but you are going to stop there. That's when the X comes in place. Then you get them stable, and you're gonna leave there and you're gonna move on. So an X could be an origin, it could also be a destination. That's fine, it just depends on that specific scenario. X is the payable destination, the only payable physician's office destination. Now, please keep in mind that during um, COVID and during some of the other public health emergencies, we understand some of these rules are wavered or put into place due to that. I'm not talking about that here. We're not gonna get into all of those different things here because that's so many different um, so many different scenarios that would go into that. So if you want to learn more about that, that's something you have to go up to the CMS website or take some different opportunities that we have available on that. All right. Next set is questions. So again, if you have a question, put it back in the chat. I'll get that answered for you. All right, here we go. First question. It's for a freestanding ER. So that's exactly what you wrote in there. You wrote standing ER. I'm going to assume it's freestanding. If not, you're going to have to put it back in the chat to help me out here. But for Medicare to cover the transport. The key thing about it is the freestanding ER must be part of the hospital off-campus department, part of the hospital. That means the certification through the enrollment process is done through the hospital. If you want more on this, there is a code of federal regulations, CFR guidance that tells you how to consider this. Um, you wanna make sure that you're aware of that code of federal regulations guidance, again, CFR, and it's 42 CFR section 413.65A2. I'm gonna quick copy that out. Give me one second while I paste that into chat for you. And, and with that, I, I will also then paste a link for you. So give me one second while I grab that link. I just want you guys to have all of this in case you need to know about that off-campus stuff. It gets a little tricky and a little confusing, but it does mean that you may need to ask the freestanding ER, are you part of a hospital or not? If they are not, there is no covered destination or origin for this. Um, so you would, you could use, again, a physician's office, you could use something related to that, just make it fit for an origin. Destination, no, not covered as a destination, therefore this would be a GY situation saying it's statutorily excluded. All right, I'm going to stop talking for a minute and ask Leanne if we have any questions. We do have one question in the chat, Tom. And the question is, what would be the correct origin and destination modifiers when the patient is transferred from the hospital in the U.S. to the Canadian bridge to transfer the patient to a hospital in Canada? So the origin and destination modifiers in that case wouldn't really be adjusted. So if they're going hospital to hospital, that's fine. Um, but remember that the mileage stops at the bridge. Remember, so you're going to have an A0425. You are still doing a hospital to hospital transport. However, we don't pay for mileage outside the United States. So you would want to make sure that that's a little bit of a different scenario. Um, now, again, if you pick them up at a resident and you're taking them over the bridge, then it would be into the hospital or resident to whatever the situation is. Hopefully I'm, I'm making that about as clear as possible. Um, there's lots of scenarios, but, but the origin is where you picked them up still, the destination is still gonna be where you dropped them off at. You just wanna make sure that your mileage ends at the border, where that bridge is, where that border is technically at. Uh, if you need more, let me know. Uh, Leanne, any other questions? There are no other questions at this time. All right, perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and go on then. So these are just some tips um, based on some the, the bigger overall picture questions. These will go by fairly quickly, so you know. So tip number one is for two trips on the same day. Um, doesn't matter if the origin and destination are exactly the same, residence to hospital, residence to 
hospital? And the answer is, as long as you can medically support that they were two separate trips, they are both billable. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few moments. So it's got to be the same patient, same um, same data service, and um, similar or the same origin destination. Again, a lot of times we see this residence to hospital, residence to hospital. So someone goes to the hospital because they're feeling well, they're weak, they can't get up. It is a medically necessary covered stay. That would be an R to H. They get them stable, send them home. Then they fall in their kitchen at 10 o'clock at night and they break their arm. Well, now they're going back to the hospital, but not anything related to the original one, right? So now we have two trips the same day. Yes, we will deny this because we can't tell the difference. To us, it looks like you build it twice. You do need to do an appeal and you do need to make sure that you have the appropriate origin and destination modifiers and the documented time within the appeal to show that it's two separate trips for two separate reasons. All right. Modifier GY, uh, correctly used to show the patient transport is statutorily excluded. In other words, the patient could go by a different means or the destination is not covered. Here's what you don't want to do. Um, the SNF's not paying, neither is Medicare, so we're going to put a GY on it and say, hey, Medicare, pay this. Well, no, that's not appropriate. You need to determine who should be paying, and if it is the skilled nursing facility's responsibility based on the, the resources and the other things, then you may have to go after them um, because they owe you for that. Medicare isn't supposed to do that. Also, recently we've had an uptake of using the GY to make Medicare make a medical necessity decision. That's not appropriate. You should be making that decision based on your documentation and putting a GY on there, then filing an appeal so that we remove it and then we have to make a medical necessity decision based on that. Now, I do know that there are some consulting firms out there that are telling you to do this. This is not what needs to happen. Keep in mind, this is different than when you have a patient do it, because a patient, you'll put a GY on it and the patient will say, no, no, I, I want to file an appeal. That's fine. Let the patient file the appeal. It's not the same thing as a provider appending a GY and then filing an appeal to tell us, hey, we think it's medically necessary. Well, then why did you append the GY in the first place? So I wanted to bring that one up as well. And last, we did have a couple of questions about how the origin and destination modifier affects the advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage, and it doesn't affect it at all. Remember, the advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage, or ABN, is given to say a transport is medically necessary, key, medically necessary, however, not at the level provided. Common situation we see this is when an air transport occurs, when a ground would have been medically um, satisfactory, in other words, would be okay for the medical need. So it doesn't really affect your origin just modifier, right? However, what it could do is affect a code that you're billing, and you could also append a GA modifier with the origin and destination modifier, with it, okay? Want to make sure you have that in its all there. So you do need that valid origin and destination, and you do need to make sure you have this properly documented. All right, so that's my tips um, that we had, and those were based on some of the questions that I got. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys gather any questions that you have from there. What I'm going to do is run through the rest of the pre-submitted questions, the ones that you sent during registration, and then we'll move on to see if you have any other questions. So the first pre-submitted question or one from registration was, is it a uh, modifier 59 used for an ambulance transport? Keep in mind, modifier 59 is not an origin and destination modifier. And is it something that is available? The answer is no, not for an ambulance transport at this time. Now, this is just something that WPS has made a determination on. Um, so I can't answer the question as to why the upper management and why the medical directors and everyone felt that that was not an appropriate use of it. CMS does recognize modifier 59 for national correct coding initiative edits. That's not this situation. So I'm not sure when you're thinking you should use a modifier 59, but it also has nothing to do with origin and destination. So no, we don't want to do that. Um, some basic documentation questions came in. And some of them I'll answer, and some of them I'm going to tell you are not related to this. So, for instance, they had a psychotherapy code question and whether or not they can code that. That's not related to ambience, so we're not going to answer that today. On the other hand, the type of documentation questions that came in are what needs to be in their documentation to support the coded modifier. This is very key. First, for an origin and destination, I need to know what it is. Is it a residence? Is it a facility? Is it a site of accident? 
what is it? Where did you pick them up at? And I also need an address or the closest zip code to that for the origin. Because remember, what if you pick them up at the site of accident? Is there a technical um, um, zip code for that? Sometimes and sometimes not. What if they're driving down I-95 and on I-95 at mile marker whatever, that's great. Then you're going to try to determine the closest um, zip code for that. And that's going to come into some of the billing stuff because it also drives payment. As a destination, I need the name, the facility name. Where did you take them? It could be residence, right? That would not need necessarily a name, but if it's a facility, I need the name. I need an address, street address. You did not take them to a PO box. Yep, somebody asked me that question, and I'm not sure how you fit that patient and um, the, the staff to treat them in the PO box. So destination PO box does not work. Name, street address, city, state, zip code plus four, which means a nine digit zip code. All of that is what's required for a destination. Next question is how do you decide which modifier to use when the patient is transported for wound care and doesn't matter how the facility is licensed. So it would depend because you could have a hospital right. So this would be owned or off campus and that's I gave you that code of federal regulations very specifically for uh, as this would be another one of those examples on. Um, so we look at this particular situation. So let's say it's owned or operated by a hospital. And even if you're going to a freestanding wound care or whatever, then it's hospital because that's what it is. If not, it could be a standing diagnostic facility. So it does directly affect it. And it just depends. You're going to pick the best one based on what we have. Um, now, if you said, I look through the list and nothing applies, nothing applies, then it's a GY because it's a non-covered destination. It's not part of Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Um, I'm sorry, it's not part of the Medicare program. I guess I should have finished that thought. It's not part of the Medicare program. It's not part of the federal rules. So therefore, GY applies. So if you have more questions on that, let's uh, let's get those put into chat for me. Next, what revenue code do I bill with? So for those of you that are not billing on a UB04 or an 837I, ignore this. You don't bill with a revenue code. For those of you that are, it is a revenue code 54X, depending on if it's ground or air. And for Medicare, it's usually a 540, just FYI it is. Um, if you say, hey, I need the leading code, it's always a leading zero, right? So 054X is what you want to look at, 540. Start with those codes and then determine which one is best for you. Okay, so if you want to know more about that, I will recommend that you go out. I'm going to show you another resource right now. We're going to take you back out to the... Um, uh, CMS website, and I'm going to go Medicare. Now this time, what I'm going to do when I go home is I'm going to go back to those manuals. And coverage and, or I'm sorry, we're going to go to coverage and or that regulations and guidance, not coverage, regulations and guidance, manuals, and only manuals. When I scroll down, we are looking for the Medicare claims processing manual, which is right here. And then as I scroll down, you're going to want to look at two different manuals for some billing information. Okay. Here is 24 CMS 1450, also known as the UB04, or the CMS 1500. So if you want to know which one to use, you can check out these two different manuals. Also, don't forget that you can always stop at chapter 15 to find out different pieces of information because this is specific. The other two manuals are general. All right, um, and then someone said, hey, can you translate the paper claim form to the we would put it in for the modifier for ambulance? I definitely can do that. So on a 1500 claim form, it's going to go in 24D following the procedure code. That then translates to loop 2400 segment SV 101, et cetera. So there's a variety of different SV segments. 101 is the start, then you know, you'll move through different ones as you need to. For the UB04 or the 1450, it is in field locator 44, which is following the procedure code. How does that translate to the electronic claim scheme? Now we're talking 837i. It's in loop 2400, and it's an SV202 to 20, 20, 
SV202-3 through 202-6. This is your modifiers column. Now, some of you say, wait, I don't know all that programming and I don't need to know that. Mine just comes up and it puts it where it needs to go. That's ideal. Um, I was asked specifically for that information, so that's what I have for you to offer on that. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my pre-submitted questions. Uh, Leanne, anything? <laughs> We do have a couple. The first one is, does it modifier 76 for the second build transport show that the transports with similar or the same POP and POT for same dates show that they are not duplicates? Right, so modifier 76, not something that we recognize. There are other contractors that do, and I'm gonna recognize that right up front. Um, if you have that question, I do need you to send it. It has to come through customer service and be tracked up through to the contractor medical director contractor medical directors or CMDs, they then have to look further into it. Um, I have given that to them before. Uh, one of our contractor medical directors is looking at it. I have not got a definite answer on whether or not that will change and so that we could accept it or not. But at this point, uh, WPS does not do that, does not recognize that. We did have a question just come in. The question is, if we received payment for a claim that should have been billed with the GY modifier, should we do a reopening to append the GY so the claim can be processed correctly? You can do that, yes. Um, so yeah, you could, do a, you could do a reopen and the GY, it will automatically take the money back. You could send us um, the refund and no, notifying that it is a GY modifier. You could refund the claim entirely and then submit a new claim with GUI on it. So there's a variety of different actions you can take, but yes, one of them is to do a reopening. But remember that no matter what you do, you do have to give Medicare the money back. That is the last question that we have, Tom. Perfect. So I do want to thank everybody for spending time with me today. Hopefully I got all of your questions answered. Uh, we want to thank you for listening. We want to encourage you again, take that survey, give me the good, the bad, and the ugly. Remember, it helps us improve. Also, we really do want to hear about other topics you want, whether it's related to ambulance or not. That's awesome. If you're going to give me something related to ambulance, be specific. Don't just say ambulance. I will encourage you again, check out that live events page. Sign up for those additional webinars. We have a lot more coming on ambulance, and we want to be able to give you what you need. So on behalf of myself, Leanne, and all of Provider Outreach and Education, thanks for participating. We look forward to your survey comments, and we hope that you join us for future education.